Thank you very much, Neil. Thank you, uh, Australia National University, for uh, inviting me and, uh, and, uh, and affording me the opportunity to you know, see this beautiful campus, beautiful city, and to enjoy the stimulation of, the, of uh, a lot of interesting colleagues in, in RegNet, where, where, uh, where I've been housed. Uh, the topic of my, um, of, my, of my talk today is political dynamics of systemic legal change. Uh, what, do, what do I mean by that? Um, I've, been, I've been interested for some years in the challenge of trying to figure out what is distinctive about a national legal system and about why national legal systems differ and the political dynamics of legal change. That's uh, a rather daunting, almost quixotic kind of thing to, uh, to do. It's a challenge because of the immense variety of laws within a single legal system and because of the constant incremental changes within a legal system. But plunging blindly ahead, I, uh, I wrote a book on that subject uh, called Adversarial Legalism, the American Way of Law. It was published in 2001. It argues that the United States has a distinctive legal style. It tries to show that compared to other countries, the American legal style is particularly legalistic and adversarial. It's more punitive. It's more costly. It's more open to political influence, more open to a broad range of legal claims. And I labeled that style adversarial legalism. And the consequence of that is that America's way of governing itself tends to be more permeated by law and by legal conflict and by litigation. There's more frequent use of courts to obtain political and policy change, more political conflict over courts and law. It penetrates into daily life in government and commerce more often. That book was published 11 years ago. So my question today is, what about now? Have global pressures for con convergence in the last 10, 15 years reduced the cross-national differences in, that I describe in, 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 in my book? Is adversarial legalism in the, in the United States moderating? Has it faded or has it grown? Are the legal systems of other countries becoming more like that of the United States? I only have time to address some of that today because I'm going to concentrate on developments in the United States. So here's a quick summary of what I'm going to say. I'll argue that in the last two decades, the United States has seen the rise of a methodically constructed, well-funded conservative legal movement and a broader conservative political movement. And together, they have eroded the cultural consensus that underlay the earlier growth in the American regulatory state and adversarial legalism. Adversarial, adversarial legalism hasn't gone away, but it's now politically controversial. It's politically contested, and its political valence has shifted. It's more often used now, I don't know, more often, it is often used now to promote conservative values and opposed, as opposed to more egalitarian values. Moreover, in some ways, other legal systems have come to have more features of American adversarial legalism in the last decade. More law, more litigation, more use of courts to decide important political and policy issues. And that narrows the differences a bit. But I'll argue that American legal exceptionalism, though not quite so as exceptional as it was, really persists and is likely to persist in the future. So first, let me talk about what, what do I mean by adversarial legalism. <laughs> across many areas of law, across many spheres of public policy, American methods of making and implementing policy and resolving disputes tend to be more legalistic than their counterparts in other rich democracies. <laughs> by legalistic, I mean that legal rules in the United States are unusually detailed, prescriptive, and complex. Legal conflict is more common. Legal violations elicit heavier penalties in criminal cases, civil cases, regulatory enforcement alike. Legal claims, legal conflict, and concern about legal rights and liabilities more fully pervade uh, commercial and governmental life, as I said before. And this contrasts with what I call the bureaucratic legalism that's characteristic 
of Western European parliamentary democracies in their former colonies. In those countries, governance is more completely the province of governmental agencies and bureaucrats with less interference with lawyers and, from lawyers and judges. Not none, but less. There is less frequent use of litigation in courts as a mode of political action. That's the legalism part of the definition of adversarial legalism. Second, legal dispute resolution in the United States tends to be more adversarial. That is, in comparative perspective, it is, it is more dominated by the entrepreneurial initiative and jousting of lawyers for disputing parties. Uh, judges are less controlling. In contrast, in the continental European legal tradition, the judicial process is more bureaucratic than adversarial. It is dominated by judges, not by competing lawyers and the adversarial complexities of trial by jury. Even in Great Britain, Canada, Australia, and other former British colonies, the so-called adversary system of litigation and adjudication is, is considerably less adversarial, more, jump, do, more judge dominated, less costly than in the United States. Um, you'll want to know, is adversarial legalism good or bad? My answer to that is yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, on the positive side, the quote from the first at Paris page of my book, adversarial legalism makes the American legal system especially open to new kinds of justice claims and political movements. American judiciaries are particularly flexible and creative. American lawyers and litigation and courts serve as powerful checks against official corruption and arbitrariness. They, they're protectors of individual rights. They're deterrents to corporate heedlessness. But at the same time, adversarial legalism is, is a markedly inefficient, costly, complex, cumbersome, punitive, and unpredictable method of governance and dispute resolution. It inspires legal defensiveness and contentiousness. Um, it's hard to do an overall balance sheet, it, like, like many things in life. It's good, but it has its bad sides as well. Um, uh, so my question today is, the United States forever locked into patterns of adversarial legalism? In the last chapter of the book, I, ar I, I argue that adversarial legalism is so deeply rooted in the American system of government and in, in an American political culture that its fundamental features almost certainly would continue to endure. And to explain that prediction, I need to discuss why it arose in the first place. American political culture was forged in the run-up to a violent revolution against the politically unresponsive, distant monarchy. So from the start, Americans have been mistrustful of concentrated government power. That's just a simple part of American political culture. <coughs> Resistance to rule by governmental bureaucracies. And like the original Tea Party and its contemporary namesake, hostile to government taxation. So as a re emerging from that political culture, uh, the 18th century constitutional design decentralized power, it fragmented it, it limited it. Both state and federal governments restricted government by means of written constitutional rules and individual rights enforceable against governments by independent courts accessible to ordinary citizens. Even compared to federal systems like Australia, the fragmentation of power in the United States goes further. First, separation of powers. American constitutions, at the national level, at state levels, at city levels, fragment governmental power into legislative, executive, and judicial branches, each with powers to check and often to stymie the others. Second, and importantly, political party power in the United States is fragmented. Compared to most democracies, American political parties are less cohesive, less disciplined, and that too fragments power. Parties can unite and concentrate power. Fragmented parties disperse it. It makes it harder for presidents, governors, and legislative leaders to rule. Due to this distrust and fragmentation of power, throughout the 19th century, government bodies in the United States were small and limited. State and county courts were called on to provide governance. 
called into action by litigation, judges developed and enforced the common law of contract and property for a market economy. So adversarial legalism as a mode of governance has deep historical roots. Um, in the 20th century, especially beginning in the 1950s and 60s, the reach and intensity of adversarial legalism in the United States grew and grew remarkably. One cause was, at least in, my, in the way I characterize it, is the growing salience of a new strain in American political culture. Americans and the interest groups they formed came to expect and demand more active government. They developed what the legal historian Lawrence Friedman is called a culture of total justice. That culture, Friedman argued, was stimulated by modernity. Uh, in the 20th century, people came to realize that modern societies have the technical, technological, and organizational capacity to prevent many kinds of misfortunes and mistreatment. They can invent double hulls for oil tankers and tests to detect carcinogens and social insurance programs and regulatory inspectors and so on. If those techniques exist, people came to think, government should mandate their use. Meeting rising political demands for total justice seems to require more law and a more powerful, more activist government to devise and enforce it. And that dynamic, growing societal capacity for social engineering, rising public expectations, rising demands for activist government and more law affected all economically advanced societies. It drove the growth of the, of the, of the modern regulatory state and the modern welfare state. But in the United States, that desire conflicted with a political tradition of decentral, decentralized government. Adversarial legalism provided a way of reconciling, however roughly, those inconsistent political desires. For example, ad advocacy groups seeking new rights turn to the courts. American judges who were selected politically and educated to treat the law pragmatically were very responsive. They read new legal rights and remedies into the Constitution and into existing statutes. Courts led the way in ending racial segregation in southern schools. Judges revised tort law, making it easier for injured people and entrepreneurial lawyers to win very large money damages from corporations, local governments, and hospitals. Adversarial legalism was a way of expanding governmental command and reach into the society without expanding the government bureaucracy, without raising taxes. Um, politicians, however, also responded because particularly in the 1960s and 70s, they were pushed by grassroots social movements like the civil rights movement, the environmental movement, the consumer protection movement. They enacted statutes that created sweeping rights against discrimination and pollution. They, they created powerful new government agencies to enforce them. But here again, we have the tension. New powerful agencies combined with traditional mistrust of power. So legislatures created these agencies, but they constrained them with very detailed rules and procedures. They gave businesses and advocacy groups the right to challenge and sue government administrators for noncompliance with those statutory rules and procedures. So American judges ended up ruling on the scientific and uh, economic rationality of governmental regulations, or forest service logging plans, and much, much more. And individuals and advocacy groups were empowered to sue business corporations and local government agencies for not complying with federal statutes and regulations. So in sum, the more government grew, the more adversarial legalism was employed as a way to implement new laws and to hold government power but accountable at the same time. So it's because of these very basic political dynamics rooted in American political culture and political structure that I argued a decade ago that adversarial legalism would remain the, the basic American way of law for the foreseeable future. Today, however, you can raise some questions about that conclusion. And I'll spend the rest of my time today telling you why. Most importantly, the last 15 years have seen the rise of a conservative counter-reaction to the political and legal culture of, of total justice. 
It includes a marked hostility among political conservative leaders and among conservative judges to the regulatory state, the tort law system, to, and to adversarial legalism as a mode of governance. As a result, it seems to me, political support for adversarial legalism has eroded in recent years, and this change has impacted law and legal practice. This hostility to adversarial legalism and regulation has not arisen spontaneously. It's been consciously politically generated by determined, well-organized, well-funded political conservative and business organization. Ideological conservatives have created think tanks and networks that have fostered anti-status constitutional theories and skepticism about regulation. Conservatives have pulled the Republican Party sharply to the right for the more fervent anti-tax, anti-regulatory stance. Hard-right Republicans have succeeded to a, to a significant extent in placing ideolo ideological allies on the ju judiciary, on the airwaves, and in both state and federal legislative bodies. Conservative organizations have used the mass media to disseminate distorted stories of overbearing government regulations and an out-of-control tort system. Plaintiff's tort lawyers I've spoken with claim that these negative stereotypes uh, about undeserving claimants and greedy lawyers uh, now affect the attitudes of jurors and probably many politicians as well. This assault on adversarial legalism and total justice in the realm of public discourse has been important, but to translate their ideas into law, conservative Republicans had to gain political power, and to a considerable degree, they've done so. Of the last eight presidential terms, Republicans have controlled the presidency, and hence the federal bureaucracy, for five, that's 20 years, and the Democrats, 12. After decades as a minority party, the Republicans have maintained majority control of the House of Representatives from 1995 to 2012, with the exception of 2009 and 10. Republicans also had majorities in the Senate, and hence both houses in Congress from 1995 through 2007. In consequence, Republican presidents have been able to appoint ideologically conservative lawyers and judges to the U.S. Supreme Court and the U.S. Courts of Appeals. George W. Bush, president from 2001 to 2008, installed business-friendly leaders on a number of federal regulatory agencies. Um, and in addition, Republicans now control more governments than the Democrats. A majority of state legislatures have, have, have tried to constrain adversarial legalism by enacting tort reform laws that limit money damage awards and that reduce injured plaintiffs' liability, ability, I should say, to obtain damages from corporations and government bodies. I think it's even more important to note that legal change is propelled not merely by enacting new laws and regulations, but through what political scientist Jacob Hacker has referred to as political drift. That is, the failure of a polity to a, a polity, political system to adapt existing laws and legal institutions to, social, to economic and social and political and technological changes that create new risks, new kinds of injustice. By fighting for political drift against doing, by playing, uh, by, by, by fighting against doing anything, an anti-status political party or movement can achieve some of its goals simply by playing defense, by blocking new legal initiatives. Uh, one example in that realm uh, concerns environmental health and safety regulation. My Berkeley colleague, David Vogel, recently put, published a book called The Politics of Precaution, a comparative analysis of regulatory stringency in Europe and the United States. In 1960s and 70s, really into the 80s, uh, Vogel writes, the United States led Europe in, in, and the world in enacting stringent precautionary regulations to control pollution, chemical pesticides and additives, unsafe motor vehicle designs, and other risks. In that era, American regulation often put risk reduction ahead of minimizing compliance costs. But since the mid-90s, a major political and policy reversal has occurred, kind of a big flip-flop. European countries, propelled by the U EU government, have become the world leaders in initiating stringent risk control regulations. They often employ 
employ a strong interpretation of the precautionary principle, which emphasizes avoiding errors of under-regulation, that is, regulating too little or too late. Meanwhile, the United States has become a much more reluctant regulator. The precautionary principle has given way to an emphasis on avoiding mistakes of over-regulation. From a regulatory policy leader, the United States has become something of a laggard, at least in comparison to, to Europe. For example, Vogel points out the United States has not adopted new, new, new regulatory standards concerning food safety, chemical safety, control of genetically modified agricultural products, regulation of carbon emissions, and much more. So how did this reversal in leadership happen? Vogel goes through the story I just talked about. He notes that both the Republican Party and major business organizations like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce have moved sharply toward more ideological, across-the-board opposition to government regulation. Business organizations spend a fortune on lobbyists to fight regulatory initiatives. And their lobbyists are guaranteed a respectful hearing by the business community's contributions to politicians' electoral campaigns. And conservative opponents to, to regulation have become much more outspoken in the public sphere. To quote Vogel again, in recent years, each claim about a new risk is likely to be challenged by a counter-narrative containing that it was misinformed. This conservative um, uh, verbal war on regulation seems to, have, uh, seems to have affected public opinion. In the 2011 survey, almost 60% of respondents in the United States agreed with the statement, government regulation of business usually does more harm than good. That figure had grown substantially, uh, steadily, since 2002. Even terrible things are happening, like the Gulf oil spill, Gulf Mexico oil spill. And polarization has increased. 84% of Republicans, but only 22% of Democrats think there is too much regulation. I think these changes in public opinion indicate that the political legal culture of total justice the culture that drove the expansion of regulation and adversarial legalism in the 1960s and 1970s has been seriously weakened by a counterculture of skepticism and even hostility. David Vogel's book is about environmental health and safety risk regulation. I, I could tell a story today about regulatory drift and about conservative success in blocking regulatory responses as new markets were created for risky home loans and financial ma manipulations, undermining the giant financial institutions and, and you know, dragging the whole world into, in, into depression. But I, don't, well, I talked about some of that yesterday to some of you, and I, I don't have time to go into it today. Um, let me talk about another bit of evidence of change. The conservative political legal, legal movement mounted an assault on one key element of American adversary legalism, the implementation and elaboration of public law by means of private litigation. And that campaign was carried out both in the courts and in the political arena. I'll talk only today about the consequences of that uh, assault in one arena, the United States Supreme Court. Experts in the the uh, somewhat technical and arcane law of civil procedure seem to agree that in recent, de recent decades, a conservative majority on the US Supreme Court has repeatedly sought to constrict adversarial legalism as a mechanism of enforcing public law. Law professor Andrew Siegel makes a compelling case that hostility to, leg to litigation was an organizing theme in the Rehnquist Court's jurisprudence. Jurisprudence. His references to William Rehnquist, appointed Chief Justice of the Supreme Court by President Reagan in 1986, he held that position until 2005. He, people talk about the first Rehnquist Court and the second Rehnquist Court because after 1994, there were more Republican appointees, and Rehnquist led a court that was dominated by and large by a five judge majority of. Now, nine, nine judge court, five judge majority of conservative Republicans. Reviewing scores of these low visibility Supreme Court cases in that 1994-2005 period 
Siegel discerns a common thread that he calls a quote, visceral antagonism to, to the previous generation's expansion of adversarial litigation as a mode of governance. Case by case, the Rehnquist court made it more difficult for individuals to pursue rights claims against government bodies and business corporations. I'll just, let me just uh, quote his summary. Or repeat his, I'll quote, I'll, I'll read his summary. Um, the court has narrowly construed statutes and the federal rules of civil procedure and prior case law to reduce and, re and eliminate remedial options for plaintiffs in civil cases. The court has protected governments and governmental officials from financial liability for violation of individual rights by expanding immunity doctrines and cramped interpretations of federal statutes. The court has consistently upheld the legitimacy and enforceability of form agreements whereby large organizations such as brokerage firms, hospitals, telephone companies, and signing up companies shield themselves from lawsuits diverting customer claims into industry-run arbitration systems. And it is, uh, and to continue Siegel's summary, and the Supreme Court has birthed novel constitutional limitations on the scope and size of recoverable damages, particularly the punitive damages that are feared and hated by large corporations. I might summarize those cases in another way. The court's rulings and opinions seem to reflect a tendency to worry a lot about the risk of government and business operations, the risk to them that's posed by unfounded litigation and by excessive legal deterrence. Um, those risks do indeed come about in the system of adversarial legalism. But the court majority doesn't seem to worry about the opposite risks, the risk of leaving egregious rights violations unremedied and the risk of inadequate deterrence of such violations by government, uh, the risk of inadequate deterrence of, of violations by government bodies and business corporations. In other words, you know, I said before, adversarial legalism is good and bad. To the Rehnquist court, it's all bad, and they're ready to throw away the good. Uh, John Roberts was uh, chief justice appointed to the court by George W. Bush, who succeeded Rehnquist in 2005. Under his leadership, the same conservative hostility to adversarial legalism seems to continue. In a recent Law Review article, law professor Howard Wasserman writes, the court has divided sharply along ideological lines in cases addressing compelled arbitration of civil rights claims in lieu of litigation, rules for bringing class actions, specificity of pleading in criminal rights and civil rights actions, and uh, in other words, ruling that the plaintiffs in, in lawsuits have to provide much more specificity rather than making a general claim and relying on pretrial discovery to fill in the details, which is very difficult for individuals when they're suing large organizations. In all cases, Wasserman continues, a conservative majority bluntly limited certain kinds of plaintiffs' access to the courts, constrained as a legal and practical matter, a meaning op meaningful opportunity to obtain judicial remedies for violations of rights. I think I might have time to give you one example, one of these egregious examples of one of those cases. There's a 2011 case called uh, Connick against Thompson. John Thompson was convicted of murder in Louisiana in 1984 and sentenced to death. In 1999, 15 years later, after many years on death row and several last minute postponements of execution, New evidence came to light. The county prosecutor had failed, as clearly required by law, to inform Thompson's defense lawyer of blood evidence indicating that Thompson was not guilty. In 2003, after various appeals, Thompson was retried for murder. He was found not guilty. Subsequently, he brought a civil lawsuit against the county government for violation of his constitutional rights. His lawyer showed that exculpatory evidence had been concealed in the county district attorney's office for 15 years. The Louisiana jury awarded Thompson $14 million in damage, one million for each year he spent in prison. But in a five to four ruling with the conservative justices in the majority, the Supreme Court reversed the award, deciding that the county attorney's office was not liable. 
One example of misconduct by one prosecutor the court held does not prove that the office itself was liable for failing to meet the, relative, the relevant legal liability standard, which is failure to adequately train and supervise individual prosecutors. The majority brushed aside Thompson's attorney's arguments that liability in such cases is, is essential to give district attorney's offices incentives to adequately train and supervise individual prosecutors. Uh, I note that such incentives might be helpful as suggested by a March 2002-2012 study by the respected Innocent Project. It showed that 91 criminal cases in the adjacent state of Texas, since 19, in, in 91 criminal cases since 2004, the courts had ruled that the prosecutors had committed misconduct ranging from hiding evidence to making improper arguments to the jury. It's sort of an interesting, you have to understand that prosecutors, you know, we don't have a professional, national professional prosecutorial corps. It's a local political appointment to be a prosecutor. They're not usually, actually, they're usually, most states, they're elected. They're not, in many places, they're not highly professional. They're not, there's no state attorney general that can hire and fire local prosecutors. The national attorney general has no control of them at all. Adversarial legalism grew as a way of providing lateral attacks, lateral ways of holding them accountable. But here the Supreme Court is eroding that and that evidence of you know, how, how, how often prosecutors mis misbehave in Texas, that's one study that shows it, uh, suggests that this, that's a serious attack on adversarial legalism. Now let's see if I can find my way back to where I was. Um, I think I can. All right. OK, to summarize, the conservative political and legal movement has slowed or arrested the extension of adversarial legalism in the United States. The Republican Party should win the presidency and gain, gain control of both houses of Congress. I would expect it to make further big changes in adversarial legalism. So the first general conclusion I draw from this is that adversarial legalism is not inevitably the American way of law. It is politically contested. And that suggests that national styles of law are not entirely fixed by political traditions and structures. They can be bent one way or the other by the surges and declines of partisan political movements and parties. Um, nevertheless, it seems to me that the political structures and institutions and processes that undergird adversarial legalism in the United States still remain fundamentally intact. Conservative, conservative, conservative tort reformers have not made major changes in the basic institutional practices of the tort law system. Trial by jury, uh, with broad juror discretion to award such substantial damages for pain and suffering, contingency fees to attract the entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial lawyers, lawyers' powers to amalgamate cases into class action, lawyers' powers to engage in extensive pretrial discovery. Conservative pre Supreme Court decisions have made it harder to bring some kinds of statutory and constitutional claims in federal courts, but they have not changed the basic structures and incentives. They've nibbled at the edges, but the structures are still there. Similarly, the slower pace of regulatory enactment that Vogel describes is not meant that regulation has not grown in the United States or that it will not grow in the future. When highly visible regulatory failures occur, the culture of total justice kicks in. It quickly gives rise to outraged demands for regulatory fixes. In the last four years, the Obama administration, even in, in, the, in the face of determined Republican opposition, has pushed through Congress important new regulation in several policy fields. From new regulations about oil drilling in deep waters, reserve requirements and governance in, in financial institutions, and in the derivatives market, new regulations in air pollution, uh, new regulations about mistreatment of the most vulnerable people by private health insurance companies and more. Um, uh, so most fundamentally, the United States remains, with, regardless of these changes in the last 10 years, an extraordinarily law-dense society. Its laws and regulations remain the most detailed, complex in the world. 
which requires businesses and hospitals and universities and governmental bodies to retain the services of hordes of lawyers. American judges are still selected or elected through partisan political processes. Courts still play a major role in shaping the electoral process. They rule on the constitutionality, usually negatively, on campaign finance laws, the new electoral district lines, and as in the fateful case of 2000, Bush against Gore, on the conduct of elections by state and local governments. But if the political and legal structures that encourage adversarial legalism remain deeply entrenched, I think we can say that the ideological valence or political direction of adversarial legalism is subject to change. And let me give you one more case to illustrate what I mean by that. In 2010, President Obama signed into law the Patents Protection and Affordable Care Act. One controversial provision requires, requires individuals who remain uncovered by expanded public and private health insurance plans to purchase their own health insurance policies, mostly at heavily subsidized rates. 26 Republican state governors, a small business association, and conservative legal advocacy groups filed lawsuits in several states, many states, arguing that the law, arguing that the law, particularly that so-called individual mandate, exceeded Congress's constitutional powers under the Interstate Commerce Clause, its power to regulate interstate commerce. That lawsuit's a classic example of American adversarial legalism in action. Uh, right. invoked by Republicans, conservatives. The use of litigation to seek political victories in battles that an interest group or political faction had lost in the electoral arena. Lower federal courts in different parts of the country divided on that Commerce Clause issue. Republican judges tend to strike, tended to strike down the individual mandate or the whole law. Democratic judges all upheld it. Excuse me. In June of this year, as you probably know, I imagine these battles get, because they're sort of so public, <laughs> get broadcast around the world. The closely divided United States Supreme Court upheld the individual mandate. To the surprise of many and to the outrage of the political right, Chief Justice Roberts voted with the four Democratic justices in that regard. But he wrote a very complex opinion. He used different reasoning than the Democratic justices sort of undermines their, the, the, the Commerce Clause argument. Indeed, he joined the other four Republicans in an, in an opinion that limited the reach of Congress's power to regulate Congress in the future. The five Republican justices, the four plus, the four wrote it, and for most conservative ones, plus Roberts's vote, uh, their opinion departed from a line of precedent 70 years old. And it did so in a manner that creates a new legal pathway for business interests to challenge for future congressional regulatory statutes and, and, administer, and administrative regulations in court. And that invites judges to employ more demanding standards in scrutinizing laws and regulations enacted under the Commerce Clause power. One more case. In 2008, a conservative majority of the Supreme Court decided that the Second Amendment to the Constitution, ratified in 1790, establishes an individual right to possess arms and struck down Washington, D.C.'s gun control law for violating that right. This was a big surprise. I mean, throughout much of my life, when I went to law school in the 1960s, that's not what the Second Amendment meant. It didn't confer an individual right to bear arms. But in this case, too, the conservative, so the conservative justice relying on recent scholarship, a lot of it generated by the National Rifle Association originally, um, uh, they departed from these longstanding understandings. And in that decision, together with a subsequent one that applies that decision nationally, the first decision was about Washington, D.C., it invites the National Rifle Association to challenge state and local laws regulating the sale and possession of guns. That's a litigation process that's likely to continue for years to come. So the moral of these last two cases is clear. The conservative Supreme Court and justice, uh, justice, the conservative justices 
and their ideological mates in the conservative legal movement at large are skeptical about and even hostile to adversarial legalism when it facilitates individual claims against law enforcement bodies or individual claims against businesses based on anti-discrimination law, product liability, labor law, and environmental law. But these conservative judges have had no compunctions about making rulings that expand adversarial legalism by facilitating lawsuits by businesses against governmental regulation or by individuals against, like gun owners against governmental regulation or against affirmative action programs designed to promote racial equality. So my conclusion is that the ideological tunes played by adversarial legalism may shift over time as partisan politics and ideological tides bring about change in particular rules, doctrines, and procedures. But the music of adversarial legalism, sometimes sweet, sometimes discordant, will continue reinforcing American exceptionalism in that regard. And here we'd like to hear your questions. been thought um, of as um, a useful weapon for the weak. Um, you may not really be able to access anything else, but you can do it through the courts. But with this shift, uh, and so in an adversarial system, you might think, well, that, that would encourage you to still say that. But given the ide ideological nature of all the things that are happening, I would assume that uh, that the opportunities for the weak are narrowing and narrowing. And the, as the opportunities for business uh, are expanding, as a conservative, ideologically driven judiciary uh, find, uh, or, or you know, rather than association, whatever, those windows expand. Uh, presumably, it's the case that the opportunities for the weak, by and large, are now to, as a, to use the courts as an alternative mechanism uh, are now contracted. Is that a fair? I think they've contracted, yes, but the question is how much? Um, uh, the, the, the courts have made it a little bit more difficult. The procedural rulings make it more difficult. It will it makes it harder to get certain remedies. It, it's that the, the gradient that you have to march up is steeper, or the the, 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 the doorways you have to fit through become a little bit narrower. But I think you know, cases will still flow into the court. Prisoners will still petition the courts for violations of their constitutional rights. Uh, people will still sue attorney, you know, county prosecutors for evidence of malpractice. And they may, the next time their lawyers will try to get more systematic evidence before they do it. That's not easy. But I don't think. The impulse to do it will still be there. It's, there there's still a lot of laws and the, the basic structures that allow for cases to be brought um, uh, are, are, are still there. When the Supreme Court, a lot of things that the Supreme Court did was, it goes along with a new constitutional statutory interpretation theory. The growth of adversarial legalism was stimulated by the practice of judges in the, in the 1960s and the, under the chief justiceship of Earl Warren and the period that after, to take statutes and constitutional provisions that didn't say anything about a right to enforce them through lawsuits, but commands the governments. And the court would imply an individual right to bring a lawsuit. Fourth Amendment forbids unreasonable searches and seizures. That, as and the Warren Court said, well, that also allows individuals who have been victimized by one to, um, to, uh, to, to argue to the court that it should not be used, that, that, that evidence seized that way should not be allowed to be used in trial. That's also a very, it's an activist ruling that invented that ex uh, exclusionary rule. Um, uh, the court, uh, there was a Supreme Court decision that said that that Fourth Amendment also gives right to an individual 
right of action to bring a lawsuit for damages against law enforcement officials who, uh, who conducted an illegal search and seizure. Supreme Court decision of, uh, in, that, 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 that in, in one of the articles I mentioned a few years ago constricted that. The, this court doesn't like implied rights of action. Whenever it has a chance to do it, it takes away an implied right of action. Now, a Congress could always enact such a law. Con or a state legislature can enact a law that would allow for more lawsuits. The current political climate, though, makes it very difficult for legislatures to explicitly create new rights of action, opportunities to use the courts to enforce general principles. But there's still an enormous flow of such cases that still go on. There's a recent book by um, Charles Epp, political scientist, in the United States called Making Rights Real, that talks about uh, the, the expansion. There, there's a, there was a, a post-Civil War statute that made violations of the civil rights law that said violations of civil rights by governmental officials um, can, um, that the, when in, individuals can bring a lawsuit to, to, get, to, to get a remedy against them. During the 1960s and 1970s, the Supreme Court revived this old statute which hardly ever been used. Uh, sort of like an interesting kind of statute when you think about it. It's very typical of adversarial legalism. The post-Civil War Congress had no, once Reconstruction ended, there was, there was no federal bureaucracy in the South to enforce civil rights laws. So they created a private right of action to do it. It didn't work very well for 100 years. But the Supreme Court sort of woke that up by implying new rights in the 60s and 70s. And in, in Epps' book show that in the starting in the 80s and 90s, sort of a, lawyers became much more skilled at bringing lawsuits against police departments for violating that right by not, by not controlling police violence. Um, they joined by police reformers, took those fear of litigation generated by those court cases to push uh, municipal police departments and city after city to institute better police training programs, police supervision programs concerning the use of force. It's a very good example of how adversarial legalism can produce changes in governance. Um, that's, that machine is still there. <coughs> the machine is still there for use. So I wouldn't say that it's contracted enormously. It's contracted some. The more, the more conservative uh, judges dominate the courts, the more conservatives, legislatures, don't like adversarial legalism at all and won't try to remedy those cases, the more those opportunities will, will, will be set. But it's interesting that there's something very, there's a broad cultural political consensus on the right to sue, the right to sue, the right to call government officials into court, court for doing something wrong, to call, call corporations into court for doing something wrong. And so there's, 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 there'll be way, you know, legislatures will be getting petitions for new statutes to expand those rights all the time too. It's, nor, it, I, it's hard to say what the, what the overall direction is. The more conservative the country becomes, you know, the, the more that adversarial legalism will be restricted. But nothing that's happened so far is major. Yes? <coughs> Thanks again for a wonderful presentation. I guess I just have a comment and a question. Um, I mean, I thought the storyline that you developed was very compelling. It was essentially a political culture argument in which you uh, set forward the idea that the culture of total justice sits quite uneasy with the traditional culture of an anti-status perception yeah. in the US. And uh, essentially, arbitrary legalism is an outcome of that tension. Uh, it's a mitigation factor. Yeah. So. But then when you continue to describe the last 15 years, um, I must say I'm a bit surprised that your storyline is largely an institutional storyline. 
In other words, yes, it's true that conservatism is on the rise, but as you pointed out, the country is polarizing. So it's actually happening on both sides of the spectrum. And what really makes a difference, at least listening to you right now, is that power balance has shifted. In other words, the House of Representatives and the Senate has been controlled by conservative forces, and most importantly, probably the Supreme Court. In other words, I guess what I'm trying to play back to you is that you know, your argument on the one hand is a political culture embedded argument, but your change argument is an institutional argument. And if that's true, then I would say we can't really make judgment so quickly about whether there is a change in terms of that view now, because I think it would depend highly on you know, how the political wind is blowing. So in other words, if it happens that Obama appoints, can appoint another Supreme Court judge, and the balance is shifting, and maybe the flavor of the months in the House of Representatives is shifting, maybe we go back to what you described earlier as a total justice. The, the second question, and this is more explorative since we are, let's see the banner behind it, the College of Asia Pacific, I was just wondering, how much are we really talking about a, a unique American phenomenon? And you made the point quite clear. But to what extent, and I remember your presentation in Hawaii on, on consequential court, courts, uh, to what degree can we say this idea is also spreading now to other parts of the world, including Asia, where we see an increasing amount of constitutional courts and so on emerging, and you know, civil society as part of the modernization process using these courts in the process of challenging. All right, great. Two good questions. <laughs> Um, I, think the, I think the story I tried to tell was that, in a way, I'm trying to say what happened is that a counterculture developed first and was able to, it gave ideas to conservative politicians, the judges, it generated a set of ideas that contested the whole way things were, were, were running in the United States. And the more Republicans gained power, the more they could put agents on, on the courts and in the legislatures who, who adopted those ideas, then that, that made for the change. I think, I think ideas matter in politics. And of course, you know, and it's not just these ideas, politic, politics shifts, you know, no one's debating this in the presidential and congressional elections today, uh, but they're debating other ideas, so other things matter. But uh, ideas, once politicians gain, gain, gain office, what they do is they're influenced by their culture. And also, you know, some of the public opinion poll on regulation shows that people in the middle are much more, uh, 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 not so eager for regulation. Vogel's argument talks a lot, of, Vogel's book talks a lot about public opinion too, and he thinks that a sort of um, a, a complacency developed in the United States, sort of a faith in that reg there, there was enough regulation. Uh, there weren't, there was a stretch where there weren't a lot of, there, the alarm bells were not so great. Whereas regulation grew in Europe, the flip flop which it talks about, as because there are very highly publicized disasters, like the, like the mad cow disease, that mobilized pu and public opinion, and fear grew rapidly, so you get more cascades like, like, uh, you know, concerning uh, genetically modified foods. So anyway, I think culture, public opinion and culture are part of that story too. Um, there's a whole, had I had more time, I have a whole part of my talk about what's happening in other countries. Daniel, of course, there's one, one thing that's made the United States a little less exceptional has been the rise of constitutional courts in many countries as a react, or often as a response to totalitarian or highly authoritative regimes, demand a distrust of parliamentary democracy alone, and the demand for checks on parliamentary democracy by a constitution with rights and constitute courts with constitutional powers to overturn legislation and hearing rights claims in the courts, capacity to rights claims in the courts. Daniel Kellerman has, and so, so uh, in many countries around the world, constitutional courts are playing, as you said, a you know, much signif more significant role in government, from South Africa to India to Taiwan and, 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 and South Korea uh, to uh, Brazil. Um, 
So something is changing in, 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 in Germany and France as well, so that constitutional litigation becomes much more common and use of courts becomes greater as a mode of engaging in politics. In that sense, it moves toward the United States. Daniel Kellerman, political scientist, has a very interesting new book called Euro Legalism, who, where he, he, um, he portrays something that I've written about, too. Um, and there's a chapter I didn't put in adversarial legalism on this because it was getting too long. Um, uh, how the EU, like the United States, makes rules but doesn't have a bureaucracy to enforce them. And so they've used the court of, uh, European Court of Justice to, and a direct uh, facts doctrine to enable European law to be enforced in member state courts by litigation. And so there's more lawyers in Europe, more litigation, Kellerman points out. My only point in that regard is that there are stopping points. It's a much milder form of adversarial legalism. The modes of adjudication are still hierarchical and not uh, adversarial in litigation like the United States. But the distance is, so I think if the, if, if, if the United States was here before and Europe, for example, was there, we've moved a little bit and they've moved this much, but there's still considerable difference in legal style between them. Last short question, Julie. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, I'm not capable of short answers. <laughs> <laughs> your, your talk uh, identified for me a couple of tensions which I don't really understand or I don't understand how they're justified. So there's the tension between a strict separation of powers and the very political way that judges are appointed and expected to act in the United States. And then there's the tension between um, the denseness of the law, the specificities of the law, and the expectation of incredibly activist courts interpreting um, mm -hmm. those laws. Could you just comment on, I mean, is there a pushback against uh, uh, the appointment of judges uh, and their expectation of being acting politically on the base? Is there any, is there any Debate about those tensions. Oh, okay, yes, yes. You know, conservatives, you know, have been very vocal on denouncing activist judges and demanding strict interpretation of the Constitution and of, and of statutes. Um, that doesn't stop conservative judges from making very activist decisions if it's producing the values, advancing the values they want. So we sort of have a culture that both values adherence to law and rules to control things. But uh, that, does, that, that, that exists in absolute contradiction to the mode of appointment of an you know, election of judges in states. So they're political, and no matter how specific the rules are, judges can usually, if there's, there's, it never, you know, rules can never decide cases. It always takes judgment, and judgments will vary between conservative and liberal judges. So there's a, it's a tension, but it's a tension that's never been reconciled in the United States. We want the rule of law, and we want political responsiveness at the same time. Who doesn't? <laughs> well, we try to do it both at the same time. We don't make a choice of one versus the other.